So this morning, um, we are continuing on our series um, that I have titled, Then Sings My Soul. As we continue on, as we look at different hymns that we all know and love. And, and this hymn is, is, is one of my favorites. I love the old rugged cross. And, and did you know that George Bernard was born in Ohio shortly after the Civil War? And, and his father, he was a coal miner, and, and, he, and, and eventually he moved the family to Iowa where George came to Christ through the ministry of the Salvation Army. He felt the call to train for ministry, but his father passed away and he needed to stay and take care of his mother and his siblings because he was the primary caretaker of his mom and his sister. Instead of going to school, he worked to provide for his family and he read books. And, and, and as he read the books, he, um, he learned a lot, but he eventually was able to train and become a preacher. And when, when the home's needs were lessened, he went and became a preacher. And at one point in a rough spot in ministry, he needed to have a deeper understanding of the power of the cross. And so he prayed to God that God would reveal to him the true power and love of the cross. And he, he gives this experience and he says it was like John 3.16 started to come alive off of the pages for him. And, and it was several months that as he, would, as he saw this, that the words started to come together. And while he was preaching, in mid, preaching through Midwest Georgia, the song finally came together in the words of the old rugged cross. And we still sing and love this song today. And if you don't, you should. Because we will cherish the old rugged cross until our trophies at last we lay down. And when the day comes, we will exchange the cross for a crown. And so this morning, what I wanted to do is I wanted us to take a look at two different passages. I want us to look at John 3 for sure, but then there's another set of verses that always come to my mind when I think of this passage. And so this morning, if you will be so kind to oblige with me as we look at these two verses, as these two different sections. But first, let's turn to John chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 18. Again, that's John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. So John starting um, John chapter three, starting verse 16 says this, "For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. I love this verse, guys. Because it says, God so loved the world. And yet, everything I hear is how the world is an evil and wicked place. How could God love the world? How, how could God love the filth? How could God love the brokenness that is our world right now? And yet, the Bible tells us that God loves the world. And, and, I, and it, made me, it always makes me stop and think as I think about this statement that God loves the world. It makes me think about Parenthood. I know it sounds weird. I haven't even quite got to the big points yet. But one thing I, I, I've seen and I think about, you know, when a, when a father or a mother sees their child doing things they shouldn't, when they see them messing up and falling apart and you see, they see them 
maybe walking away or doing things they shouldn't. Is it not possible? And I just want to ask, when you see your son or your daughter falling short or messing up and you see them, maybe some would say they're ruining their lives or whatever it may be, do you not think of them as a baby? Do you, do you not think about them as, as a toddler whenever they would mess up and, and instead of seeing your adult child, you see them as a little the baby that you rose. And I wonder if that's not how God sees our brokenness. I wonder if that's not how God views the world. Because remember, when God created the world and He finished creating everything, what did He say in Genesis? He said it is it is, I'm sorry, I only heard like two people. This is Bible study time. It is? It's good. So, so God created the world and he said, it is good. And things were not good when sin entered the world. And yet God still loves the world. God still loves his creation. And God loves his creation so much that means that he loves you. And the beautiful thing about God loving you is that He loves you on your best day and He definitely loves you on your worst day. And so He loves us so much that He did what? He sent His one and only Son. That He gave His Son. In other words, He loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son to live the perfect life for us, to deal with mass persecution, to be in pain, to hurt, to have some of the worst moments to where he is literally in the garden sweating drops of blood. He loved us that much that he would go through all of that. To die on a cross on Mount Calvary. Because he wants us to believe in him. It's pretty simple, right? He says that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but they will inherit eternal life. God wanted His people to believe in Him. And, and, and not only did God want His people to believe in Him, but He wanted them to believe in His Son. And not just that. Why is that? Because Jesus is the true essence of God. In other words... He's not the God who wants to destroy you. He's the God who wants to save you. See, the Bible says if you believe in Jesus, you will live. Because why? God did not want to condemn the world, but He wanted to save the world. Think about this in Judaism. See, why did they follow the law? Why was it so important that they follow the law? Why? Because they didn't want God to condemn them. And yet, what John is telling us is, no, God does not want to condemn you, but He wants to save you. He wants you to have life. He wants you to have purpose. And it all starts with believing in the loving and caring Son of God. He does not want to condemn the world but He wants to save the world. And so when you believe in Christ, you are saved. But when you disbelieve in Christ, you are condemned because you have not believed in God's one and only Son. In other words, Jesus came and He performed all of these miraculous things that proved who He was. There were so many prophecies that were proven in the time of Jesus. And it wasn't one of those things where like we close the door and nobody sees what's going on. No, the miracles were out for everybody to see. All of the information, all of the facts were there. And so you either you believe or you don't. And He wants everyone to believe But if you don't, you're condemned. Because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. 
In other words, Jesus is the only way. But that leads to a question because we've talked a lot about this word belief, right? What does that mean? What does that mean? What, is, what does belief in Christ mean? Because if we are to believe, if we are called to believe in Christ, then there has, that means we've got to get it right. I think about what James tells us. James says, good, you believe in God, so do the demons, and they shudder too. So what is this belief that Jesus is calling the fo- his followers to? So we're going to pick up in our text in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 25. So Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 23, says this, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So what is believing? Well, Luke tells us believing is taking up your cross and following Jesus monthly, right? Oh, no, it's, it's daily. My bad. Wrong version. So picking up your cross and following him daily. In other words, believing, belief is an active word, right? In other words, you have to have an active faith. What Jesus is calling them is you need to be active in living it out by picking up your cross and following him. It's denying yourself. It's saying that I am no longer who I used to be, but I am made brand new in Christ. And that means I must pick up my cross daily and follow Him. Now, the image that that Luke uses is that of the cross. And we love the cross. We wear it around our neck and everything else. And it's beautiful, right? Right? And realistically, it's become a symbol of Christianity, but to the Romans, that would be like us wearing a noose around our neck. Why is that? Because, believe it or not, the cross was one of the worst ways to die and realistic that I can think of in all history. See, what, what they would do, the Romans, is they would set these crosses up around the street and they would hang the people by the cross. They would bang nails in them and things like that. And they would sit there for days and slowly die. It was the biggest shameful act that they could do. Why is that? Because what the message the Romans wanted to send with the cross is if you mess with us, you rebel against us, this will happen to you. It was a symbol that said, you don't want to be on the wrong side of Rome. And yet Jesus died on the cross. And the cross that was considered the most shameful thing that you could possibly do to be executed became the very symbol of salvation of the entire world. Jesus turned the whole system upside down. And Luke continues on with this and says, if you want to save your life, you must lose it. 
Isn't that a weird way? Isn't that upside down? Because many people come to Christ who are, who are looking for redemption and looking for salvation and looking for hope and peace and joy. And yet what the Bible tells them is if you want to save your life, you have to lose it. You have to step in. For us, it's stepping into the waters of baptism, dying to yourself. And I, and I hate to say it and I hate to tell you guys this, but it's dying to yourself daily. And being raised again brand new. But it's saying I'm going to turn away from the things that I used to be. I am dying to myself and I am following Christ. If you want to save your life, you must lose your life. In other words, God has to strip the broken pieces from us bit by bit. And I would love to tell you it's easy and you never feel any pain. But it's through the pain and the hurt that God chips away and makes us right in His eyes where we become whole. And then He goes on and says, what, what good is it to, to, to gain the whole world and what it seems to me, as I, I did some little bit of research, it seems to me what, what Luke is talking, well, what Jesus is talking about here is wealth means nothing. In other words, what, what good is it for you to spend all of your time trying to gather and save and work and condemn and forget about your family and all these other things that we do to try to gain for it, for you to basically, you're going to die one day, right? And you can't take it with you. So what good is it for you to gain the whole world and lose yourself? What good is it for you to, to spend all of this time and, and condemning everybody else and doing all this other stuff just to build yourself up for you to lose it all and yet what you've done is you've lost the ability, you've lost relationships, you've lost so many different things. In other words, the things we store up, it means nothing but how we interact and we love people and treat people matter the most. And living for Christ means we build and we strive to build others up. And the last part of this is Jesus will disown those who are, who are ashamed of Him. You know, I used to, uh, I, I've gotten a little bit older, but I used, to, I used to go to sports clips and get my hair cut. Anybody ever get haircuts anymore? They're expensive. But, but I used to always hate this conversation when it came up because it was always the end of conver all conversations. And, and I regret that. And I, and I don't like that I used to think this way because I, I realized this, these verses are starting to weigh a bit more. Um, and, I, and this had happened a lot in college where people would be like, so, so what are you going to school for? And I'm like, I'm, I'm going to school to be a preacher. And it was complete silence after that. Nobody would say a thing. And, and I used to be like, oh man, they must be thinking I'm a weirdo or, a, or something else or, or I'm not relatable or anything else. And so I used to hate that question. But now that I've gotten older and I'm starting to understand more and I'm starting to realize that, hey, eternity is out there. I hate to say it, I was being ashamed of Christ in those moments. And I regret that. And I think we all have moments where we are worried and afraid of what other people are going to think when we tell them, A, we're a Christian, or for me, B, I, I'm I want to be a minister. We cannot be ashamed of what God has done. And I think back, and I, now that I'm older and I think about it, I was embarrassed because it was the end of conversation when, this, when Jesus changed everything about my life and has, has taken me from places that I never thought I would be and, and has done, has led, I mean, at that point, it led me to Oklahoma, the, you know, the wilderness, um, from Texas and all of these other things that God has done. And I'm ashamed of that? So I, I want to say, number one, I'm sorry about that. 
But I'm so glad that we serve a God who helps us to see the error of our past. So guys, we cannot be ashamed of God, but we must stand up and proclaim Christ. Why? Because we have no other choice. Think about what God has taken you through. Think about what God may be taking, pushing you through right now. And think about where God's going to take you in five years. We can't be ashamed of Jesus because Jesus has changed everything. So what that means then is believing in Christ is living out your faith daily. It's, it's realistically, it's whoever believes will not perish but inherit eternal life. In other words, it's, it's an active faith. It's, it's picking up your cross and carrying it daily and saying, I, not only do I believe in this, but because I believe in this, I am going to live it out. And as I'm living it out, I'm going to carry my cross and I'm going to lay down all of the things that get in the way of my faith in God. It's I'm going to lay down my insecurities. I'm going to lay down my awkwardness. I'm going to lay down the things that used, that are the thing that brought me to Christ in the first place. I'm going to give that to God. I'm going to lay down my bad decisions. I'm going to lay down my worries. I'm going to lay down my pain. I'm going to lay down my shame. And I'm going to follow Jesus. I will cherish the old rugged cross. Until my trophies at last I lay down. And I will cling to the old rugged cross. And I will exchange it someday for a crown. Because when we cling to the old rugged cross. I truly believe we show the world the love of God. And that love can and will change lives. So church, I pray that you lay down all of your trophies, all of the things that get in the way, all of the awkwardness, all of the shame, all of the pain and whatever it may be. I pray that you lay it down and you cling to the cross. You cling to the instrument that was meant to destroy, and yet God says, no, I'm going to make it an instrument that saves. And when the day comes, when we have finished, God promises us that there is a place made for us in heaven. But we cannot be ashamed we must live this out every single day. Because let's face it, the world needs to see Christians who cling to the cross. I don't know if you guys have realized it or not, but there's a lot of hurt and they need to know genuine love. So let us cling to the cross and know that when it is our time, we'll exchange it for a crown.